this is the fifth installation of a seven-part seminar. And we have, uh, the first one was the making of America. The second one was capitalism versus socialism. The third one was where the founding fathers got all their philosophies from. See, they, they put this together, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of history. They put the whole thing together. They put philosophers like Locke and Blackstone and Adam Smith and Montesquieu and Cicero <clears throat> and uh, Polybius, the great Greek historian. They, they had him involved. Most people haven't heard of Polybius. Particularly when they go to 7-Eleven for a big gulp, they don't ask the guy in the back, well, do you know who Polybius is? Um, but Polybius is the one who came up with the separation of powers. How do you like that? The Founding Fathers had read that. He was about 200 to 100 right in that period BCE. Um, and then it wasn't until 1800 years later that a man by the name of Charles de Montesquieu in 1848 wrote a book called The Spirit of Laws that nobody reads anymore. <clears throat> but it's the book that the founders read and they figured out that this is the type of government we've got to have. We have to have separation of powers because Jeremiah says in the 17th chapter in the ninth verse that man is um, unstable. Man is not stable. So we know that and so we know that there has to be a division of power. And the founders knew all this. Well, then last week, <clears throat> we had a lesson called Washington Creates America. And we found out that um, we had this indispensable man, George Washington, who all of a sudden popped up at the right time and helped in the creation of the country. Now, Washington was not a philosopher. You know, when you win the war, which we should never have won, that's the Revolutionary War, <clears throat> um, you have to put something in place. Something's got to be put in place. You won the war, okay, you, you won the Revolutionary War, uh, which uh, the, the English had 400 ships, they had 32,000 redcoats came into New York Harbor. The Americans saw this, they were scared to death. They retreated. They just about lost right there. But a couple things happened uh, to, to extenuate the war right in the beginning because that's when we should have lost it. But we had a couple of natural occurrences occur. Well, you won the Revolutionary War. What are you going to do about that? Now what are you going to do? What are you going to put in place? Well, Washington was this great moral force that people looked to. And all of a sudden, the idea came that, uh, well, we need to have um, a man by the name of uh, Palatia Webster. You don't have to remember that name. But uh, he was an important individual. In 1781, he said, we've got to have a convention. And he was agitating for a convention in 1781. Then all of a sudden, Hamilton picked up on it. And the man we're going to talk about tonight, who you cannot separate from the American experience. Well, uh, Washington's great moral force uh, was so great that um, all of the delegates that came to the Constitutional Convention had been writing Madison, and they said, um, that's a great idea, but we're not going to come unless Washington's there. We're not going to come. He's got to be there. And I'm going to show you, because I was there, I filmed this. In, in 1787, I filmed this whole thing. And I'm going to show this to you, not just yet, Stu. Not yet. I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm just introducing it. Um, I'm going to show you what happened and how this all played out. Um, but first, before we do that, uh, I gave you a little introduction. Um, I want to tell you something.
This is one of the greatest men that ever lived. Okay, there's a picture when he's older. And I'm going to show you a picture when he's a little younger. This, by the way, both of these books are absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. This is the modern day. This is easier to read. If you want to read about Madison, get Lynn Cheney. I have, uh, can you see them? I have read, this book here is kind of like reading the Federalist Papers. <laughs> so I suggest to you to read this book. Lynn Cheney wrote about James Madison, and, and she has a little a disclaimer, a life reconsidered. A life reconsidered, yes. Can you see him? This is James Madison by Ralph Ketchum. Ralph Ketchum's from the University of Virginia. And you've got uh, James Madison by Lynn Cheney. Well, okay. We have Jefferson and Madison's letters. A third of them. I've got the other two thirds at home. We might read... Uh, some of this today to you. Uh, all you young people, uh, make sure that uh, you read some of those letters because that's where you learn American history. You learn it from the original. Uh, question, question everything. Question things. You find out yourself. You be your own master, your own investigator your own person that, that makes the sacrifices. Question all things. Je Jefferson gave that um, counsel to all of us. Question everything and find it out. Prove it yourself. Um, I would highly suggest that. But I would suggest to you, because there's a lot of bad history out there right now. There's a lot of history that isn't... Uh, uh, by the way, uh, at 7 o'clock they lock the doors and there's sometimes people come after 7 and they, they don't, just, just to let you know. Um, You've got to go to the original documents. You have to read them. And then you say, oh my goodness, MSNBC was wrong. <laughs> ABC didn't tell the truth on that one. NBC, look what they did. That's not what Madison said. But we've thrown Madison under the bus now. This is one great man. Now I want to read a little bit about him to you. He, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, but you, you go study and make your own opinion. He was the greatest theoretician of government in American history. In American history. Uh, he helped Although Jefferson was the Renaissance man, and we're going to talk about Jefferson next week, because he's, we, we need, by the way, the seventh lesson is on restoring America. And you know what we need to do? We need to have, one of the things we need to do is have four holidays. Martin Luther King, George Washington, we have to reinstate and not make it Nordstrom's Day. <laughs> We need to have Abraham Lincoln, and we need to have another holiday, Thomas Jefferson. Separate holiday. And you could, you could add Madison there, but then you'd be spending a lot of money on the holidays. Well, Madison was the greatest theoretician of government in American history, is a man who did so much for his nation, of which he has recognized so little. That comes from Lubunsky, who wrote about the, you want to read about the Bill of Rights? We should never have gotten the Bill of Rights. You know, I went to a class yesterday on the Constitution, and um, the teacher never did teach the Constitution. He talked about the Bill of Rights, and then they talked about freedom of speech and the whole. We got to know the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is fine. And it's great we've got the Bill of Rights, because it's Madison. Madison's the reason we have the Bill of Rights, you know. Well, uh, Madison was born in 1751. And when did he die? Born in 1751. How old was he when he died? Anybody know? 80-something. 
80 what? Three. Four. <laughs> yes! <laughs> How do you like that? 85 years old, you're still around. And I want to tell you that um, we almost got a civil war in 1833. And uh, Andrew Jackson saved the day. And I want to tell you something. Uh, John C. Calhoun, who Jackson, one of the regrets of his life, at the end of his life, he was on his deathbed, and he said, I've got two regrets. Uh, one of the regrets is that Maria, my horse, uh, didn't win, uh, didn't beat this other certain horse. And the other regret I have is I didn't hang my vice president, John C. Calhoun. Uh, Calhoun believed that the Constitution said that you can secede from the Union. And he was spouting this, <clears throat> and he was quoting Madison and Jefferson on their letters to Virginia and the Kentucky Resolutions. Well, guess what? Madison was still living when he was doing this. And Madison had a visit from President Jackson. And Madison said, we never said that. That's wrong. This is a union. We have to be a union of states. If you, if you start seceding from the union, there's no union anymore. And he went through the explanation. He said, that's not the way to do it. And he, he kind of corrected that, because he was still living. Now, Madison is, um, is a man that was very erudite, and he must be studied very closely. Because when you read him here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, he wrote 29 of the 85 Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. Hamilton wrote 51 of them, and John Jay wrote five of them. There were others that were writing, but some of them weren't accepted and some of them dropped out. But Madison wrote 29 of them, and um, they're very... <clears throat> when you read the Federalist Papers, I suggest... How many of you have read the Federalist Papers? The whole, all of it, or parts? Parts? Parts. 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 That's not good enough. <laughs> all of it? It's a dry book. All of it. You read all of it? Okay. Well, that's your homework assignment. Well, I, okay. I want to tell you. I'm going to give you an assignment. You read all of it? Yeah. He's read a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to give you an assignment. I want you to read the 78th Federalist. Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. Did you read that? I know I did, but not everybody was here for the assignment, so the ones that didn't do it. 78th Federalist. You need to read that. What's that about? Judiciary. judiciary. Hamilton wrote it. It tells you what the judiciary is and should do. Guess what? We are so gone from what Hamilton said. And one person said to me in a class one time, she said, hey, what's the difference? Hamilton didn't know as much as we know now. He didn't know that much, so what if he wrote the 78 Federalist? We'll be closing in 10 minutes. And she's the one who said it. <laughs> um, hey, you want to be absurd? You want to you want to be rational about this stuff, or are you going to be absurd? Hamilton is a guy, whether you like him or not, brilliant. He set the tone. He really uh, helped to get the Constitutional Convention. He did some really good things. He did veer off, but he was a great. He was great at what he was doing early on. And he, to say that uh, you're smarter than Hamilton now, uh, you know, come on. Let, let's let's be real about some of this stuff. I don't mind having debate. You want to debate about corporations? All right. You want to debate about Walmart? Okay. But 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 be reasonable on the debate. Otherwise, uh, you're you're not. Uh, You've got to be reasonable on these things. Well, Madison was the first of 11 children. First of 11 children. He was involved in every major event which required governance, governance in early America. By the way, um, the seventh lesson that we're going to have is probably going to take two and a half hours. So I'm just letting you know right ahead of time. Number seven is going to take about two and a half hours. And it really should take five, but it's going to take two and a half and if you can stay, we're going to do 6.30 to 9. That's where we're going to go with that. Because we've got the, some solutions on, I hope some of the young people hear the solutions, they can go out and, and try to, um, to try to accomplish some of those things. 
Now, how big was Madison? How tall was he? He's 5'4". Anybody 5'4 five five. here? You're 5'4? Five Are you 5'4? Five <laughs> Stand up for a minute, because you're going to be Madison. Okay, you're five four. I think you're you're. Are you five four? Um, yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> you're about five six, aren't you? Okay, there's five. Let's let's use him. Yeah, take your hat off. Take your hair off too. Uh, you're five four. Yeah, you're a little taller than him. You're a little taller. Okay, he's five four. Okay. Um, just stand up. Keep standing. Now. Do you weigh 100 pounds? More. You weigh more. more. And after you eat those treats back there, you're probably eating more and more. <laughs> Madison was 5'4", 100 pounds, dripping wet. That's a little teeny thing, and Washington called him the twig. Oh. Yeah, He's a twig. <laughs> little teeny guy, but he had the mind like a steel trap. This little guy, and he would speak at these uh, conventions that he went to. And uh, during the Virginia ratifying convention, which the vote was very close, you had Patrick Henry there. Now, Patrick Henry may be the greatest orator that America's ever had. He certainly was extremely influential, and uh, he was just brilliant. Well, he was against the Constitution. And uh, he would pound his fist and say, my country is Virginia. That's my country. I'm really opposed to this because I think this thing is going to get out of hand. I think it's going to be too powerful. And he, um, he wrote in this. You ever read this? This is the anti-Federalist Papers. I showed you the Federalist Papers of J. Madison and, and Hamilton. This is the anti-Federalist Papers. You should read this. Because then you get the reason that they, they were concerned about the Constitution. And there were some changes that had to be made. And the Anti-Federalists helped the country make some changes that needed to be made. Well, um, Madison debated Patrick Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. And I want to tell you something. We have the, the notes of that. We have the, the records of it. And um, Madison now debated him on pure logic. He never raised his voice. He was attacked. Now that's hard. That's, that's a problem we've got today. We don't have, somebody came up to me in a class today I was teaching this morning. I taught two classes. One person set up, what we don't have is heroes today. We don't have any heroes. We don't have somebody to look to to, oh, that person's talking the right way. Madison's a hero because he would get in there, wouldn't raise his voice, he kept his calm. You ever see the political debates? How many of them keep their, keep their head about them? He kept his calm and uh, Henry was attacking him and uh, he was getting it from, I got James Monroe out there, he was against the Constitution. You had George Mason, great man, he didn't sign, he was there to sign, he didn't sign it. He was there against Madison. Madison's there, this little guy, five foot four, a hundred pounds, dripping wet. And he's telling all of them he had done all this homework. He had read 200 books from 1984 to 19, uh, 19, excuse me, 1784 to 1786 that Jefferson had sent him from, Par from France. He read all these books, there was dictionaries, there was histories, all of these things. And you when you read the Federalist Papers, you say, oh my goodness, this guy knew about every government in every country. He knew what they did and how they did it. And he, uh, he made the comment that um, one thing that we've got to have, and one of the reasons that he, he, um, he wrote the best notes of the Constitutional Convention, is because he said, I noticed that these other governments didn't do that. They didn't copy down what they were doing, so I've, I have to interpolate when I read their histories. But he did it. There's 659 pages of it. This is, this is the notes on the Federal Convention. What's the title? 
notes on the debates in the federal convention. <laughs> this is Madison. Now, eight others kept notes, but none of them kept them quite like him. And we're, we'll, I'm going to read you some of the notes tonight. Uh, and what, um, because we don't know what went on there. We're having these debates today, and nobody's reading these notes. See, they, they had the same debates then. They, they decided what the best form of government was. We're deciding now how to destroy it. See, that's the difference. They're building it. They were building. But we need to go into the notes. We need to read the Federalist Papers. We need to read the ratifying convention. We got Supreme Court justices saying now it's the utmost hypocrisy to know what the founding fathers said. It's the utmost hypocrisy to make that statement and be on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. We got um, a justice, um, she's very nice. She's got a great personality. She goes over to um, Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. She goes over to South, Amer uh, South Africa, and they want to uh, do a constitution. And they say, how about, can we do the American constitution? D don't you suggest that? She says, no, don't do that one. That's outdated now. I got the, I got the article. we got to stop this. Outdated? This is, we got to stop. This is a very common idea of today. And this is what we've got to... Correct, but you got to correct it with, with knowledge and with kind of a, a Madisonian debate format. Um, now, Madison's mother lived to be 97 years old. 97. She died in, she died in 1829. Okay? Uh, she really helped him through school, and she nurtured him, and just a great mother. And when he was 18 years old, he went to Princeton. Madison went to Princeton at 18. And the president of Princeton was who? John Witherspoon. Who said that? Very, very good. Who's he? He's the president of Princeton. He was a delegate to the... Declaration. That's right, Declaration Signed Declaration of Independence. Where's he from? <clears throat> I think he was British. Scottish. Scottish. Now, let me, let me tell you about the Scots just for a minute. The American founders were very interested in the Scots. And one of the great Scottish philosophers was Adam Smith. Adam Smith never did get married, but he wrote great books, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which we've forgotten that book completely, but he took that book and then he wrote The Wealth of Nations, which the founders used. And guess what? We kicked Adam Smith out of the colleges in the 1920s. Completely got him out of there because we thought, well, he's outdated now. So we put Marx in there. Not, no relation to me. I spell my name K-S. No X. Um, that's a failure formula. But uh, there were people that didn't like our formula. They didn't like the constitutional formula. Well, and we're talking tonight about the man who mo is most responsible of anybody for putting together the Constitution. But we've thrown him under the bus now. So how are we going to know the Constitution when we've thrown him under the bus? He's the man that put the whole thing kind of together. Um, I won't read this to you now because I want to get to some other topics, but in the Federalist Papers, number 18 and number 38, he talks about the Greeks, he talks about the Romans, he talks about other governments. It's just unbelievable the knowledge this man had. He graduated in two and a half years due to hard work and exceptional scholarship taking a test to bypass his first year. Um, he suffered a nervous breakdown in college, resulting from a little sleep. <laughs> he had less than five hours of sleep a night he was trying. He was studying five hours a night. 
Experimenting on maximum application as opposed to minimum. That's what he said. It didn't work out too well. He finally said, no, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Five hours isn't enough. Really? He saw religious tolerance in the early 20s. As he saw religious which what he was big on religious tolerance. We are completely intolerant today. Tucker, just completely intolerant. I want to tell you something. If you come to the seventh lesson, seventh seminar, we're going to have prayer in school, and I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to have all the school boards in the United States vote on it. And then, yeah, but you can't, you can't have prayer. That's not right. You got forget about the state applying the, the prayer. Have the, the school children get up. If you've got a Catholic in there, let them get up and give a prayer. Let them give the rosary beads. Because, and then the children will go home, though. Mommy, guess what I saw today? Well, what would you see today? You're, you're Presbyterian. I, well, I saw the Catholic give a prayer. And he, and he used the rosary beads. And it was really a beautiful prayer he gave. Oh, really? Well, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear that. Next day, let the Methodist give a prayer. Then you get, let the Mormon give a prayer. Let the Jew give a prayer. Let the Muslim give a prayer. What's wrong with that? You'll build some tolerance for, for other religions. And you can study them. State doesn't have to make a prayer. You can, you can, the school boards can determine that. State doesn't need to determine that. That's a school issue. Um, I remember I was on a school board in uh, Washington, Federal Way, Washington. I went to the superintendent and said, we need that prayer in the school. <laughs> I thought he was going to faint. And um, he says, well, I can't do that, the Supreme Court. I said, well, have you read that decision? He said, no, I haven't read the whole thing, but they said they can't have prayer. I said, you can, you can read from the Bible. Well, yeah, but I don't want to do that. It's too controversial. Well, we better start doing something, because right now we kick God out. We better get God back. Because God is the author of our rights. Those inalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, not happiness, but the pursuit, pursuit of it, you've got the right to pursue your own happiness, however you want to do it. Well, Madison's father, James, was active in early revolutionary activity and was elected a member of Orange County's Committee of Safety. Madison wanted to join the army, but as a Virginia militiaman, he realized his physical weakness. Uh, Madison, his whole life, was very, very, he, he um, had epileptic fits. He had his stomach problems. He had all kinds of problems. And he lived to 85. And he toughed it out. And I want to tell you, after, um, after debating Patrick Henry, that would give you the runs. <laughs> I want to tell you, that was, a, that was really amazing what he did there. And then in the Constitutional Convention, would you have signed the Constitution even though there was slavery there? How many of you would not have signed the Constitution? Raise your hand. None of you, not one person in this room wouldn't have signed. So you're signing for slavery, right? Well, if you've got the Constitution, you've got slavery in there, right? You've got to make a compromise. You've got to have a union. Madison signed it. Now, I'm not saying slavery was good. It wasn't. It was terrible. It's a terrible thing. But nine of the 12 states, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the Constitutional Convention tonight, but I'll give you a little peek on the tent. Nine of the 12 states did not want slavery. True. Most of the founders didn't want it. They knew it was wrong. And the ones that had it, they were ready to give them up. But uh, I'll let you know what happened when we get to that. And then when you go to Oprah Winfrey and you talk about this, <laughs> you, you'll be able to talk about it instead of... Uh, Senator McCain got on, and he was um, <coughs> running for president. I guess it was The View. I think it was Whoopi Goldberg, now that I think about yeah. it. And he, and he was running for president, and she downgraded the Constitution because of the slavery in there. He had no answer for it. He just kind of accepted it. But you've got to be able to answer that. You've got to be able to answer the three-fifths clause. That wasn't three-fifths of a person, even though that's the way it was worked out, but they weren't denigrating the African-Americans. But you've got to know that. 
You gotta know what they did. Well, Madison was elected to the important Virginia Convention in 1776 where they created a state constitution, issued a Declaration of Rights. Who wrote the um, Virginia Declaration of Rights? No. See, if you don't know this, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you got to know this stuff. You know, I, I, I got people coming up to me now and they're saying, you know what, you're fighting a losing battle. This is all, nobody cares about this anymore. We're here. The country's changed and they don't care about the Constitution, they don't care about Madison, they don't care about any of this stuff. Let me tell you something. If the country is to be saved, you got to know this stuff. And somebody's going to come along and know it and make a change. Believe, believe me, this is going to happen. Somebody's going to hear it, some young person's going to come along, make a change, and say this is the way it really should be. Who wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights? I'm not going to let you off the hook on that. That's George Mason. That's George Mason. And he didn't sign the Constitution. You know why? Why didn't Mason sign the Constitution? No Bill of Rights. There's no Bill of Rights. And he, uh, at the Constitutional Convention, he um, <clears throat> raised his hand, he got up to speak. Now, in the, in the convention, there were rules. You know, you can't just blurt out anything you want to. You could only speak twice on one subject. Nobody could speak more than that on one subject, one topic. Uh, Hamilton took care of that when he got up one time and spoke six straight hours. <laughs> six hours straight with no notes. How many people can do that? Now, even Ted Cruz had to have uh, Dr. Seuss. I mean, you know, no notes. He spoke six hours and said, we got to go back to the British government. Nobody agreed with him. Well, so Mason was there, and he got up and said, um, listen, it was September 4th, 1787, when he did this. He said, listen, um, we need to have a Bill of Rights. Remember, I wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights. I can do this in two hours and come back. And so Elbridge Jerry from Massachusetts, who also did not sign the Constitution, uh, seconded him, and nobody else agreed. Nobody else agreed. You know why? Why didn't they agree with it? First of all, it was late in the con uh, convention. The people were tired. But there was a particular reason they didn't agree with it. Why? It's what? Slavery? No, not slavery. It didn't have to do with slavery. Because yeah. he's talking about a Bill of Rights now. It's what? Okay, the question is, um, why uh, didn't the rest of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention back George Mason to make a Bill of Rights at the Convention, at the Constitutional Convention? Why, why didn't they back him? Only one person seconded it, and nobody else voted with him. You know how I know that? Well, first of all, I was there. <laughs> but the other reason is that I, I got these notes from Madison. And I carefully looked at them. And I dug that out. You know why? And Madison later said in the Federalist Papers why. He said, because we felt all your rights were contained in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. How do you like that? But they later, they later uh, decided we better write them down so that people know what their rights are. And what is the Bill of Rights anyway? What's the Bill of Rights? <laughs> That's the first ten amendments, but what, what, is, what is it supposed to do? Yeah. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay, forget that. You were scratching. Limit the power of the federal government. That's what you're doing. You're limiting the power of the federal government with a Bill of Rights, right? That's, that's exactly what you're doing because the Constitution is not a federal document. That's not where the power is. States. Read it carefully. Tenth Amendment. It's not enumerated. States. We got big issues in front of us right now. What's that? That's gone to heck in a handbasket. That's what? The Tenth Amendment's gone to heck in a handbasket. Yes, it has gone to heck. We have to change that. There's a way to do it. We'll talk on the seventh uh, 
uh, lesson how to do it. Since the states are the people themselves. What's that? Since the states are the people themselves. Well, that's true. What did he say? The states are the people themselves. Um, we have um, misunderstood, and we've we've gone in a different direction now. Well, <clears throat> so uh, Mason didn't get the second. He got the second, but then he didn't get anybody else to support him, and he started to get real upset. Um, and by the way, we almost didn't get the Bill of Rights. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We almost didn't get it. It's only because of Madison that we got the Bill of Rights. Um, Mason kind of got um, waylaid a little bit. Let's see, Tom, there's something wrong with this, this uh, making kind of, a, kind of a noise. I don't think it likes George Mason. Um, Mason started to get upset. And all of a sudden, he got upset about one thing and another thing, and he didn't sign the Constitution. He became kind of a different person. And then he went against it in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. It was a, it's a sad thing because he was a great man. Mason was really a great man. Well, um, also, Madison was on a committee in 1776 which produced the Declaration, Virginia Declaration, and changed one phrase from toleration of religion to total freedom of religion. Elected their first governor to Virginia who was... Jefferson. No. First governor of Virginia that they elected was... Jefferson was a governor, but not, he wasn't the first. Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was just absolutely a fabulous individual. He had about 17 children. Wow. Um, <laughs> King George had 15 children and went insane. Uh, but probably not from the children, but uh, you know, he, he did. Um, Madison attended the Virginia House of Delegates that fall, and he was not re-elected in 1777. On the principle and the reason Madison was not reelected. Now listen carefully, all of you that want to be a politician. Of the principle of not bribing voters customarily with a barrel of rum or hard cider. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. Madison felt it was the pure corruption of the influence of hard liquors for votes. So he didn't get elected. So what? He kept his principles. And by the way, those principles made America. Because you can't take Madison away. You want to understand the Constitution, you've got to understand what Madison was doing there, what his thinking was. His colleagues recognized his talents, and he was appointed that winter of 77 to the elite eight-member council of state under the governor's direction of which he amassed great experience under Governor Henry and Governor Jefferson. All right, now let me tell you something about that. When the founders were originally writing up the Constitution, they were very concerned <clears throat> about the executive. They almost didn't want an executive. It was, it was really touch and go. They knew they had to have a balance of power. Um, but they were really concerned about what they were going to do about an executive. And one of the discussions was, we're going to have like five people be the executive. And we have like a council of five. And then um, a great Scotsman got up when they said that. His name was James Wilson from Pennsylvania. He says, don't you remember the, 90, uh, the 79 tyrants of Greece? They all looked around and said, yeah, I don't remember it, but what about them? And he, he told them the story about the 79 tyrants of Greece and how it didn't work. You've got to have one person that's responsible. 
They looked around the room and they said, well, I, I can't be the exact. They, they saw this tall, wonderful man, six foot two. They'd seen him on a white charger. They'd seen him at Trenton. They'd seen him at Monmouth, at Brandywine, at Valley Forge. They said, there's the president. That's who the first president's going to be. We know that. And what we'll do, we'll take a chance and we'll devise the executive office around him. About a hundred years later, you had a president who um, decided that he can do whatever he wants if it's not prohibited in the Constitution and completely changed what the founders had done. Now, uh, I want to tell you something. I, I hear time and again uh, the Constitution is outmoded. It, it doesn't work. I want to ask you a question. When did it become outmoded? You tell, I want you to tell me what was the date when it became outmoded. Because don't tell me 1901. Uh, because that was an interpretation that was wrong. The Constitution doesn't say that. That's not the way to look at it. If it doesn't say something, you can't do it. Not if it doesn't prohibit it, you can do it. That puts it on its head. 2008. <clears throat> What's that? 2008. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you, you want to say I'm going to stick out my neck and say 9-11. What's that? 9-11. What about it? 9-11 did what? Long lost our country. Oh, when we lost it? We lost it before that. Yeah, yeah. long before We that. lost it long before 9-11. A long time before that. And, uh, and I want to tell you something. We've lost it together. Yep. We've lost it together. Now we have to come together and restore it. Now you can say it's that party, it's that party. And then it's everybody. You can, you can, this is a joint thing. If somebody's doing something wrong, you stand up and say, that's wrong. You don't sit back and compromise something wrong. Blackstone, who was a great jurist, said, if a law is not based on natural law, it's no law. And, and the founders believed that. Well, um, I want to read you something. We're going to get to this. I was there when Madison did this. <clears throat> And I took the, the, uh, pic the pictures of it. I videoed it. Um, I ask a lot of people um, that we talk about the Constitution, I say, where, where did you get the authority to spend this particular amount of money? They say, well, I got it from the General Welfare Clause. I said, have you read the Federalist Papers? Well, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, the General Welfare Clause is talked about in there. It's also talked about in letters. The General Welfare Clause has nothing to do about with what we're doing now. General Welfare Clause is a general grant of authority. If individuals can't do it, and you have to do it collectively for the United States, and it's in the Constitution, it's enumerated there, you can do it. If it is not, you can't do it. Because your congressman says, I'm going to get you a sewage plant in um, Medford. I'm going to go get you a sewage plant in Medford. Okay? And you say, oh, that's great. Mm, I got a sewage plant. And you know what else I'm going to get you? I'm going to get you a road uh, kind of an overpass uh, also. Where are you going to get that from? Well, I'm going to get that. I'm on the House Appropriations Committee uh, in Congress. And I have some power in there. I'm going to get the money from, from Congress. Uh, well, Mr. Congressman, I don't know that much, but wh where exactly is that in the Constitution? Well, that's a general welfare clause. See, so all the congressmen, all the senators are using the general welfare clause to get money for their states. And guess what? We're now about 100 to 200 trillion in debt. That's not what the general welfare clause means. To spend money. Here's what uh, Madison wrote about it in a letter. 
The result of this is investigation is that the terms common defense and general welfare owed their induction into the text of the Constitution to their connection in the Articles of Confederation. See, they, they got those terms from the Articles of Confederation, which were, was a very weak document, from which they were copied. Okay, this is Madison, he's writing a letter. And are used in the one instrument as in the other as general terms. Limited and explained by the particular clauses, subjoined or connected, he said, you, he used these language, subjoined is connected, to the clause containing them. That in this light, they were viewed throughout the record proceedings of the convention which framed the Constitution. That the same was the light in which they were viewed by the state conventions which ratified the Constitution. So in other words, what he's saying is, Look, we knew what that meant. We knew what the general welfare clause was, and it's not that you can take money from the federal government and give it to any project. That, look, there's a lot of good projects. There's a lot, there's wonderful things that go on. But that doesn't mean they're a government responsibility. What are you gonna give, you're gonna give money to every, every cause that you have that's a, that's a, that's a moral cause? That's not the, the responsibility of a government. And usually it's a, it's a private responsibility. Um, and if it's not uh, by Madison's lights and the other founders, there's about 250 founders, you know, there's not just six of them. By Madison's light, if it is not particularly enumerated in the Constitution, in the body of the Constitution, it's a state responsibility. States have to do it. We've turned that around now. Well, why did we have to have a constitution? Anyway, why? Now we talk about it today, we, we're <clears throat> interested in it, although a lot of people don't know what, what it, what's in it. They're not sure what, 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 what's, the, what's the worth of the constitution. Why do I need it? I didn't want a tyrannical government run by one person. You don't want a government run by one person because they're afraid of the King George syndrome. Well, why did they have a constant? Why did they even don't bother really drawing like that up? Either. They did what? <laughs> I say we don't really like anarchy either. We don't like anarchy, but uh, sometimes you get anarchy if you don't. Uh, well, you got to have a constitution. You have to have a constitution. So you're the, saying they were having anarchy at that time? Well, not exactly, but they. Yeah, they had some. Yeah, they, they did. They did. On. They were having anarchy. Yeah. They did what? It was to keep order. I still can't hear. To keep order. To keep, to keep order. order. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you something. When did Washington give his sword to General Thomas Mifflin at Annapolis voluntarily with a packed gallery watching this? He gave up power voluntarily. This never happens in the history of man. One other example of Cincinnati went back to his farm. Washington gave his, his uh, sword to General Thomas Mifflin, who was the president of the Continental Congress that year. When did he do that? What year? And then he went, he, he rode on his big white charger and he went back down to Mount Vernon and he uh, had... Um, he saw Martha on Christmas Eve. That's right, exactly, 1783. I'm glad Ken's here. 1783, here we're at 1786 now. And guess what happened? Um, Daniel Shays, a Massachusetts farmer, he was really upset with his countrymen his own Massachusetts countrymen were taxing the farmers and they couldn't pay these taxes. And they thought it was, they were getting taxed uh, and they shouldn't have, it was wrong. So he took some of his friends and they went to march on the Capitol. And guess what happened? Shays Revolution. <laughs> it, it was called Shays Rebellion, that's right. 
and Americans were killing Americans. They got gunned down by the state militia. And 14 of the farmers got gunned down. Uh, Shays got out. Daniel Shays got out of there. Oh my goodness, when Washington heard this, and all the other, all the, the, we're going to have anarchy. What did we win the Revolutionary War for? We took, we had a miracle happen. I call it a miracle, because we shouldn't have won the Revolutionary War. That, that, that's, that, you need to study that before you leave this earth. That, that was absolutely 150% uh, the uh, divine providence was on this country. I, I, by the way, I still believe divine providence is. But remember, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, when they didn't live it, bad things happened. But I think we've got a resurgence coming. Just keep a sharp eye out. Well, all of a sudden, you had this terrible, terrible moment and the states were fighting with each other. Uh, we tried to get, uh, we, uh, we did get a treaty with Britain, but then John Adams was the first minister to Britain. Oh, was that something else? He goes to the finance minister and he says, um, what are you impressing our soldiers for? We won the war and, and the finance minister says, um, and, and Adams says, you're stopping our trade. He says, cui uh, bono. <laughs> the, the English minister says to him, Cui bono? Well, what's Cui bono mean? Well, who does it benefit? Why should we not impress your soldiers? You don't have any document. You don't have any, you have no government. We're going to do whatever we want with you. How do you like that? We won the war, but we don't have a document. We have nothing. We have the Articles of Confederation, which are what? No judiciary. You gotta have nine states. You want to tax? You got uh, thirteen colonies, but you gotta have nine of them to vote to tax them. Nobody would tax. Nobody wanted to tax them. You gotta have some kind of a central government. And it was obvious in the Revolutionary War when we almost lost it because we had a very weak central government. Well, Adams was really ticked. Oh boy, I'll tell you, he was mad. John Adams, what a great man that was. I'll tell you, uh, he he could not hold back what he felt was the truth. And he didn't care where he was and who he was talking to or, it didn't matter. And he told the truth. He said, I'm gonna be very unpopular, but uh, I'm gonna tell the truth and uh, we're, gonna get a we're gonna get a country here. And he got up and he fought to, to get a country. He says, he says, let me have a country, a free country. And he was talking against John Dickinson in 1776, and Dickinson didn't want to fight. And Adams said, the time has come now, and there's going to be a great expense of blood. And he, and he, and he got everybody to, to sign on to fight. Well, um, when you get something like this, and the states are fighting about trade, they're using different uh, monetary systems. Each state has a different monetary system. You have, they don't even want to talk to each other. And they're talking about fishing rights, and they go out on the Potomac on a boat to talk about fishing rights. And Washington says, what are you doing? Come back in the Mount Vernon on the back porch, sip a little something, and let's talk about this. And so they got, and they liked it. They went back there, they talked on the uh, Washington sports, and they said, hey, this is pretty good. We're able to talk to each other. Let's uh, have a little, uh, let's have a, a, commer a conventional commerce. Well, one thing led to another. And I want to tell you something. The American experience is incredible because not only did we win a war we shouldn't have won, but we had in place some people who could devise a government. That is very, very rare. What normally happens in the history of man is that, let me get a, a clean sheet of paper here. Okay, here's the um, political continuum. Over here is the extreme left and here's the extreme right. 
What's over here in the extreme left? Anarchy. 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 You got anarchy over here. That's zero percent government, right? And over here you got tyranny. And you can call it whatever you want. You can call it Nazism, you can call it fascism, you can call it communism, socialism, whatever you want to call it. You're heading towards 100% government. So here's where the founders wanted to go, which is called the golden mean. And that was the term that Aristotle used. They came right about here. Now, let me tell you something. Most of the time, you got tyranny and anarchy. And nobody talks about anything. You go from one thing to another. In South America, Central America, Russia, <coughs> European countries, you've had this for a long time. Here we got a chance, we sat down and talked this thing out. And um, I want to tell you, it's a rare, if ever, done thing. First you got to win the war, then you got to have somebody, and we happen to have some people in place that could do this. Just so happened that this little five foot four, hundred pound patriot was around. You can't, there's certain people you can't, you can't subtract Franklin. You have to have Franklin. You have to have Washington. You have to have Madison. You've got to have Jefferson. You've got to have Adams. Hamilton was very important. I can personally do without him, but he, he, was, he was very, very important. And um, all of a sudden, there's an agitation for a constitutional convention. And uh, Hamilton and Madison are really agitating for it. Uh, well, they have to bring it before the Continental Congress. And finally, the Continental Congress didn't want to do it. And they finally vote for it uh, February of 1787. They vote for it. They vote to have it. Now, are you almost ready over there? Oh, I'm ready. We're I've, we're been ready I've been ready since <laughs> the beginning. Good, good. We're going to, um, I'm going to show you something. Uh, how close this was. You, we, I'm telling you, you take a lot of things for granted. We all do. We're taking a lot for granted here. This didn't just come out of nowhere. This is an amazing story. And in the last three generations, we've taken enough cyanide tablets com to commit suicide. And then so. All right, why don't you run the... Di now, let me just tell you what this is. This is... Um, Madison wrote to all the delegates and said, we've got to have a constitutional convention. And we, we need delegates from all the states. Rhode Island never did come. And the founders wound up calling them Rogue Island. And they started to send ambassadors to them and treating them like a foreign country because they, they were just really recalcitrant. Well, when Madison wrote all these things, uh, they said, we'll come on one condition, that General Washington's there. That's the only condition we're going to come. Otherwise, we're not going to come. Well, uh, Madison had been writing Washington back and forth. And finally, just before this starts, uh, Washington wrote him a last letter and said, I cannot come. I have uh, family concerns. He had relatives passing away. Uh, I have rheumatism. I'm, my health is very bad. Uh, Washington would go to sleep at night, and if you put a sheet over him, he'd be in tremendous pain. Tremendous pain. He, uh, he was just about broke at Mount Vernon. He had to tend his land. He said, not only that, I promised the uh, Society of Cincinnati that I was going to speak to him, and I told him I wasn't going to speak to him. And they're in Philadelphia. So I'd be breaking my word. So he says, I I'm just not, I can't come. Now I'll play it. I'll get the lights. <laughs> We gotta have the Tom. Just a minute. Stop. We gotta have the sound, Tom. The sound. Oh no! I read it in the Gazette. Loud. 
Well, the Gazette says it. it okay, did you hear that? Should. Oh, imagine the general in our city. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Washington showed up. That was not a fait accompli. Washington doesn't show up. We have no constitution. It's as simple as that. Now he showed up early and um, you had uh, Edmund Randolph come the 15th. Who was Edmund Randolph? Virginia. Virginia. Who was he? He was governor of Virginia, that's right. Edmund Randolph was the governor of Virginia. I know you can all understand my writing. I write in reformed Egyptian. Um, but he was the governor of Virginia, and he's the one who um, got up first. He's one of the first ones to get up in the Constitutional Convention and present a plan, which he voted against. How do you like that? He voted against the plan that he brought up. It was, it was Madison's plan, but he was for it, and then he went against it. <clears throat> um, then he got to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, 
Edmund Randolph. And guess what happened? He voted for it. He said, now I'm going to vote for it because we got to have it. And Patrick Henry called him every name under the sun. And Edmund Randolph became the first... Oh, good. Oh, never mind. <laughs> first Iowan. <laughs> the first what? No? No? Signer of the Congress. You don't know this? Then your children don't know it. <laughs> The first Attorney General of the United States of America. That's Edmund Randolph. He came the 15th. Washington was there early. He came the 13th. They, they, the meeting was called for the 14th, and they never did have the meeting the 14th. Um, McClurg, Dr. James McClurg, came about the 17th. Mason came the 17th. With, you pronounce his name with. It's, 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 it's uh, written wife. And he was the teacher of many, many of our patriots. He taught Thomas Jefferson the law. But you don't pronounce it with, you pronounce it with. Um, so Virginia had a quorum on the 14th, and the Pennsylvania delegates were there. And the two delegations met before the Constitutional Convention. Did you know about this? Some of you probably knew about this. They came to discuss strategy and the Virginia plan. Now, who wrote up the Virginia plan? Where'd that come from? That's Madison. You've got to have Madison by your side. You can't take him away. I, I don't care what they say about Madison Day, because today they threw him under the bus, then they took the bus, the school bus, and then they, they rolled the school bus back and forth on top of Madison. You've got to have Madison. You got to know what he said. Otherwise, what, what, what are these debates we're having? You're not going to have him in the debate? Well, he has the Virginia plan, and I've got a copy of the Virginia plan with me. And I wish I had a, one of those um, uh, contraptions that you put the, the, the paper down, and then you can, I, I would have shown you it, but I can't do that. You have the Thermofax, the one here in, uh, in the uh, library, see? We got an overhead projector in the back. We got an overhead projector, but it's not gonna, this isn't going to show up on it. You got a Thermofax, that's what I'm telling you. So I'm going to read you a little bit. Here's the Virginia plan. I got it all underlined and circled and everything. <clears throat> Let me tell you some of the things, a couple of things that were accepted and a couple of things that were rejected. This is Madison, okay? They accepted. There is 41 points. Members are prohibited from holding any state or federal office while serving in the national legislature. Now, in those days, if you served in the national legislature, you basically wanted to go back to your farm. You didn't want to stay there. Now they make a whole career out of this thing. And that, it's not a good thing. And some people will say, and some very good people, some very good people, there's two sides of the argument. I just don't agree with the, one of the sides, and, the, and I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> um, but the, the argument is that, well, look, you've, you've developed all of these really good um, people from the Senate and Congress, and if we take them out, put somebody new in there, they don't know the, the lay of the land, and we've got to have some really good people in there. Well, I go by human nature, and I think that if someone stays too long, and you meld power with money, it's not a good combination, and then they forget why they went there. So I want to have a revolving door. I, I, so I think we need, we now, it, we've now have hit the time, this will be in the seventh lesson, um, we have now have hit the time where a bad idea has come to fruition. We need term limits. Wasn't it written in originally, though, that the people were only supposed to go back for a short term? And, and serve? No, there's, there was no term limits for the Congress. But see, we didn't elect senators and the president. Yeah, I mean, and we, by the, the way, we need to go back to that. Yeah, because they were originally appointed. Uh, we need to go back to that system. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that later because that was, it was a good system. We've abandoned it now. You want to take money out of politics? Go back to the original system. This is bad now what we're doing. 
All right, now here's one of the things that was rejected. Members shall be ineligible for re-election for a stipulated number of years after serving one term. They rejected that. So you, you were saying they accepted it, but no, they rejected that. No. Um, they, they didn't want that. Uh, they wanted um, that to be open. By the way, why did they leave the presidency open? See, we have the 22nd Amendment now, but we, we didn't have that. You could be reelected as president. Why was that left open? <laughs> it was why? I don't think they even thought that anybody would say they're forever. Because Washington was good. Because of Washington. Yeah, Washington. They left it open because of Washington? Uh, why did they do that? Because he set the example. There's a specific reason. That's true. That's true. I'll tell you why they did it. Because this is kind of a detail. Uh, you can talk about this at a cocktail party if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, they voted in committee. And most of them wanted one term for four years. That's what they wanted. Washington voted against it. Why is that? He didn't think the one term was enough. Let me see. He wasn't sure that that was enough. So they left it open because they knew he'd be the first president. They just left it open. Well, Ken. We talked about this before. Washington did vote for one term for seven years. Oh, he voted for one term for seven years? But they didn't accept Yeah, but they didn't accept that. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That's exactly right. That's the first time I've been wrong in a long, long time. Seven years. I feel it. But they left it open until when? Why did they, they did what, Phyllis? Well, what, what, what when did they, do the 20, when was the 22nd Amendment? That was 1951, right? And um, why did they do the 22nd Amendment? Because of FDR. Well, you had a president that won four times. That's right. And the last time absolutely should not have run the, for the fourth time because he was a very sick man. And he, he um, went to Yalta, which was a, another mistake. He went there, and six weeks later, he was dead. And he screwed over us. <coughs> and so uh, the Congress said, "You know what? We gotta, we gotta, we gotta amend this. We can't have this anymore." So they went and went through the states. States ratified the amendment. They had the Twenty Second Amendment, where the president could only have two terms, two four-year terms, and they took that from Washington because that's what he did. Um, I'll read you something else that was um, accepted. The national government will guarantee that each state shall maintain a Republican form of government. That's in the Constitution. That says that in the Constitution. Somebody came up to me today in class and said, um, uh, and this person has been fighting me for a long time, <laughs> and uh, finally came up and said, um, Joel, this really isn't a democracy, is it? No. no. I said, no, it's not. She says, it's a republic, isn't it? Yeah. I said, what kind of republic is it? She says, I don't know that, but I know it's a republic. I said, I'll tell you what kind of republic this is, because we're not China. They're a republic. Soviet Union said they were a republic. They were a murder board. They were, they were a prison cell. That was a murder board. You let that thing go, and you... Uh, I'll tell you, that, that's, uh, that can come anywhere if you let that thing go the wrong way. Well, we are a, what kind of republic are we anyway? That's it. I got people that have been coming to my class. This is a constitutional democratic republic. It's supposed to be. Not today. Constitutional democratic republic. How do you like that? That's what was created. We aren't that now. We're far, far away. We've got to now. Very far. We've got to. We, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. We've got to now restore. We've got to go back. 
We gotta, we gotta question everything. We gotta say, what do we do after World War II? What are we involved, what are we doing with the IMF? Is that really something we wanna do? Do we really want to fund all of these projects all over the world? It sounded like a good idea, a utopian idea, but it's not worked out correctly for us. Do we really want to go in the United Nations and be bashed every time we walk in there? Do we want to hear Israel being bashed? We've got a bunch of anti-Semites in the United Nations. Do we want that? It was, a, it was an idea that started. It, it was an altruistic idea. We, they didn't, World War II was a terrible thing. They said, well, we've got to do that. But we need to relook at this. Is the World Bank a good idea for the United States nope. to be involved in? Nope. Well, somebody's got to look, look at the arrangements we've got. They've got to sit down, not with a bunch of emotions and saying, give a couple of sound bites and that person's bad because they, uh, they destroyed their uh, emails. <laughs> Hillary? We, we can start by kicking the UN out. That was naughty. Yeah, very naughty. Well, let me tell you something. Madison did not destroy any emails. He left us this, and I'm going to read you. I need to read you a little bit of this. I want to. I want to talk more about. We're going to talk about the Constitution Convention, but I want to read you. Joel, are you going to run any more of this program here? Or are no, you going to go no, to the, the no. thumb drive next? No, I'm not even going to go to the thumb drive. Okay. You can, you can um, take the disc out. Um, all right, now we talked about slavery. First of all, I want to tell you a myth that you've been taught in school. It's a lie. This was not just a bunch of compromises. There was only three of them. Three major com This was a bunch of consensus. <coughs> 60 ballots to get a president. 60 ballots. You know how much talking you got to do to, to get your point across? It took a long time to get the Electoral College. Who, by the way, came up with that idea? Which one of the founding fathers came up with the idea? Of, you mean you're against it and you don't even know who came up with it? No. Well, I hear people against it out there. Oh, we got to get rid of it. Well, well, how did we get it? Well, I don't know how we got it, but we got to get rid of it. Well, yeah, but if you don't know how we got it, why do you got to get rid of it? We got to get rid of it because my candidate lost. So I don't like it. Well, who came up with the Electoral College? And what was the purpose of it? Who, who's the person who came up with the Electoral College at the Constitutional Convention? Population. Madison. How do you like that? Well, if you figured it, why didn't you say it? <laughs> Madison came up with it. All right, so um, the Electoral College, here's the idea of this. And we need to go back to it. We need to stop electing a president by popular vote. Now, yeah. that's going to be unpopular, and nobody wants to do that. But if you, want, if you want to get money out of politics, that's how you do it. How would you do that? You go back to the original formula, which is this. Each state has electoral votes. How do you determine, by the way, how each state has their electoral votes? Well, yes, it's, it's the amount of representatives and Senate, House and Senate. Add that up, and that's your electoral votes. Okay? So you, it is population. So let's say um, Oregon's got seven, right? It's a small state. Um, so what you do is you elect seven people to go back and decide who the president's going to be. And each state does that. Either, you can either elect or they can be, depends on what the state wants to do. You can elect or you can have the legislature appoint or you could have the governor appoint. But you, it's, it's better I'll let the people elect it. So elect it and then they they'll decide, each state will have a decision, who want, they want to be president. Now, one of the candidates running for president today says they're going to raise $2.5 billion to run. $2.5 billion. That's what it takes. You want to run for president now, you've got to have at least a billion. That's right. It's a lot of money in there. And it's not going to go down because there's a lot of power back there. 
The president now has their fingers on a lot of levers. Have you read the second article in the Constitution? There is no power in the, in the executive. There's very little power. There's a little bit of foreign policy. But the president doesn't decide like they did in 1946 after the war that the president's responsible for employment. The president has nothing to do with employment. That's something that we've made up. Anyway, um, the Electoral College, you didn't, the people did not vote for the president. They voted for the electors. And then what happened with the Senate? Did the people vote for the Senate? No. no. What'd they do? Who, yes, that's right. That's exactly they, they, The legislatures, hey, let me tell you something. When Lincoln ran against Douglas for Senate in 1858, he actually out-debated Douglas, and he got a lot of votes. My recollection is I was there, you know, I was taking the, all the votes. I wanted to make sure it was all right, me and, me and some others. Um, he actually should have won that election, but he didn't win it. How come? How come he didn't win? The legislature voted against him. He voted for Douglas. Yep. The legislature was Democrat. <coughs> they voted for Douglas. Even though uh, a lot of Republicans were elected because of Lincoln's talking around the state. You think that's fair? I do. What? Uh, if I was in a position, if I was king for a day, I would vote to repeal the 17th Amendment. I would completely obliterate the 17th Amendment and go back and have the state legislatures uh, appoint, the, appoint senator. the senator. First of all, but here in Oregon, we you have that. divided up. Uh, first of all, who are the senators uh, today uh, representing? <laughs> well, they're representing the state, really. I mean, they bring back goodies, but that's not even what they should be doing. They're representing a large federal government now. If you uh, repeal the 17th Amendment, which is the uh, popular election of senators, that was passed in 1913. If you repeal that, it was a very, it was a, it was a um, progressive populist idea. At the, the times were bringing these ideas forth. If you repeal that, and you go back to appointing the senators, who do they represent? You. Yeah, you want to represent well, you, state. but yeah. the, state. the states. Yeah. Because you know what? Hey, guess what? My name is, um, whoever the senator is, my name is John Smith. I went back, and he's talking to the legislature, state legislature, he's telling them all the things he's done. Hey, I just got you um, $5 million for road improvements all through the northern section of Oregon. And he tells the state legislature that. He said, if you do that one more time, we're not going to reappoint Tom, you. Turn it off now. Well, why aren't you going to reappoint me? Well, well, we're not going to reappoint you because we don't want your money from Washington. We want to do that road ourselves. We're the state here. We don't want your money there. Oh, my goodness. I better not do that again. Or they're not going to appoint me. You think that's really reality, though? Do it. Because here, like our, our, our legislation up in, in Salem is all democratic, basically. Democrat. Yeah. Look, yeah. <laughs> I'm not looking for a utopia. I'm just Whether it's out. realistic or not, let the people decide that. I'm telling you that this is the way to do this. You want to take the money out of politics? This is how you do it. You're not, you don't take the money out of politics by restricting speech. What are you going to do? Restrict everybody's speech? How much they can give to a candidate? That's what we're doing. We didn't do that before 1970s. Then we had the, the Supreme Court in the Buckley versus Vallejo. They said, look, we've got to have a, a limit now on what you can give. You don't want to restrict speech. You want to restrict the system and the way the system is operating. Don't restrict speech. We want a lot of speech because we had a governor run for president. His name was um, Rick Perry. Well, you may like Rick Perry, but he ran for president in 2008, and he had so much speech that he ran himself right out of the presidency because people saw that he wasn't ready for it. He wasn't ready for the presidency, but he had a chance to speak and give his ideas, 
And some of the ideas he forgot. <laughs> he went to one debate and they asked him about what, what, what departments would you eliminate? And he said, oh, I forgot what I would eliminate. <laughs> well, then we'll eliminate you. Yeah. How do you like that? We, we gave you your free speech and you didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, we need a lot of speech. Well, let me tell you something. The Constitutional Convention, Madison was taking the notes. And um, the idea came up that slavery was an abomination. George Mason, I told you George Mason was a great man. He, he got up a little upset at the end, but he was a great man. And he got up and he had 300 slaves. He was a Virginian. He had 300 slaves. He got up on the, at the Constitutional Convention and he gave a speech. I've read his speech in here. And what he basically said was this. If we don't, and he pointed to, to Rutledge from South Carolina, pointed right at him. He says, if we don't abolish this dirty business, the God of heaven will hold us accountable. And what the God of heaven will do, there's no telling. And man, did we have a civil war, and we figured, Lincoln figured out that um, we had offended uh, the highest power by what we were doing. So Mason was ready to give up the 300 slaves. He's ready to give them up. And then um, um, Luther Martin, he was drunk most of the time. He was, uh, 29 years, he had eventually served as Attorney General of Maryland. And he got up and said uh, how terrible slavery is. We gotta abolish it. Governor Morris, who had a peg leg, he had a peg leg, he talked more than anybody at the Constitutional Convention, he talked 169 times. Wow. And he would uh, bang that leg when he agreed. If it was a yay vote, he would bang his leg. He got up and said, uh, and he pointed to Rutledge again. He said, and he was, he was vociferous, like John Adams, he was vociferous in this stuff. He said, and he was from Pennsylvania. He said, we have got to rid ourselves of this. We got to abolish it right now. All right, so now I'm going to read you what the delegates from South Carolina said. Okay? Now you have the Pinckneys there. Now John Rutledge was really the head of the... Um, the crew in South Carolina and the southern states. They looked to him, he was kind of Washington-esque, he was a very dignified man. He actually was the um, second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He was appointed by Washington. How do you like that? He was governor of South Carolina. He was a really a great man. Well, here's what Pinckney said. The Pinckney boys, you had General Pinckney and Charles Pinckney. Charles Pinckney says, I wrote up a, a whole document, just like Madison, on the Constitution. Nobody's ever found it. He must have written it up, but I think he wrote it up in his dreams, because we don't have any copy. <laughs> we have no copy of it. Well, he got up and he said this, if slavery be wrong, <coughs> it is justified by the example of all the world. It is. It is justified by that. But only is justified here. He cited the case of Greece, Rome, and other ancient states, the sanction given by France, England, Holland, and other modern states. In all ages, one half of mankind have been slaves. Hey, we had, we had blacks enslaving blacks in America. Yeah, you saw that picture, um, America, where would we be without her? You seen that? That's a good picture. Did you read the book? The book is better than the picture. You really need to read the book. But I want to tell you, it's here we wanted to abolish it. Right here. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but the founders were really hypocrites because they had slaves, they didn't give women the right to vote, and they were really terrible in Indians. Well, and so were the Indians terrible to us. I want to tell you something. What did you expect? Did you expect everything to be right immediately? You don't even get that at Walmart. 
You're taking a lot for granted. You're taking an awful lot for granted. People don't change that easily. Joel, how about the indentured people in the northern part of the yeah. United I mean, the, States? The whites too. had white I mean, slaves as we well. Were, that's uh, a slavery. Yeah, you know, no slaves. question about it. Yeah, you had indentured it. slaves. Well, it North hey, Carolina, hey, look, look. South Carolina, wasn't it? Look, I want to tell you something. We're in 2015 now. You're looking back then at this society now, after all those struggles were fought, they left the door open so that slavery would be gone. They left the door open so that women could get the vote and they were getting it, the states were taking care of it. And then we had the 19th Amendment and you know what happened? Women didn't vote, but now they vote more than men. Now they vote more than men. They go to school more too. <laughs> and the Native American problem had been a big problem and it was a very, difficult solution. I've looked at it. I've studied the thing. You can't give a soundbite on that. It's too complicated. The idea was to immerse the uh, Native Americans and it was very difficult to do that. Jefferson uh, laid out the policy and nobody really wanted to touch it. They couldn't get it done and finally Jackson came along and said we better do something otherwise you're gonna you're going to count a sovereign nation in a state, and we don't want to do that. Uh, it's, uh, don't take it for granted. You're taking a lot for granted now. Um, it's, um, it's a complex issue. But let me tell you what the Pinckney said now about slavery. <clears throat> General Pinckney declared it to be his firm opinion that if himself and all his colleagues were to sign the Constitution, now listen closely, Madison took the notes, and use their personal influence, it would be of no avail towards obtaining the assent of their constituents. South Carolina and Georgia cannot do without slaves. Her slaves will rise in value and she has more than than she wants. It would be an unequal to require South Carolina and Georgia to confederate on such unequal terms. He went on and Rutledge came along and finally he got up. Everybody's listening to what Rutledge had to say. And Rutledge said, we know slavery's wrong. How do you like that? It's right in here. We know slavery's wrong, but we're going to do it anyway because it's in our self-interest. Now, you're at the Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> Federalist papers haven't been written yet. You're at the Constitutional Convention and um, you have a choice. The small states are ready to bolt. How come they're ready to bolt? What, what, are, what are the small, you got Delaware, Delaware's got like 30,000 people or something. 30 to 60,000, and Virginia's got 750,000. Yeah. So, what, so why are the small states ready to bowl? Because they, well, they, they, they don't get any bowl. They won't get the representation. Right. That's a big issue. Okay, so they're ready to go. Now, Madison's taking the notes up there. See, he's, he's, he's getting, he's, his stomach is starting to, there's no Maalox. <laughs> he's got no Kaopectate. He's sitting up there, and he just, uh, he must have been just, beside himself. I can just see it. And so you've got the small states ready to go and now you've got the southern states ready to go too. If you push that you want to abolish slavery, you can say that, but the southern states are going to walk and there's three particular ones that are going to walk and who are they? Georgia, Georgia. Georgia. North, Carolina. North Carolina. That's right. South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina. They're going to leave. And then you're going to have Delaware leave, and Maryland's going to leave, New Jersey's going to leave. You got to start over. Then what do you got? Nothing. You have. We're not here. I'm not here. Some people would like that. I'm not here. But anarchy. <laughs> you're not here. I'm not here. We're not. I'm in Russia. My my parents are from my uh, my ancestry is Russia. That's where I am. I'm under a czar. Off with their heads. We don't have freedom over there. You're complaining that the founding fathers didn't do anything. You don't even have freedom of speech. You have nothing. 
You have what the, what the, what the, what the tyranny, you've got what the leader wants, you've got ruler's law. That's what you're going to get. So what happened was, all right, we're going to compromise that issue. And we're going to put in there that in 1808, it's in the Constitution, you know. See, we talk about the Bill of Rights all the time, we forget the, the Constitution is what we're talking about. In 1808, we got the 1808 clause that says what? No more importation of slaves. Ken, Ken's right. There's no more importation of slaves. That's the first time you've been writing in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no more importation, 1808. And guess who signed it in 1807? No, no, Madison's a little later. Jefferson signed it, and he is the one that's trash today. Completely trash. We have completely trashed Jefferson. And I want to tell you something that's dangerous. Because if you keep doing that, you're not going to have a country left. Because the core of this country is Jefferson. And we need to have a holiday. You know why? Because on Martin Luther King Day, we learn all about Martin Luther King. That's great. I don't have any objection to that. But I want, to, I want the young people to learn about Jefferson now. Because Martin Luther King copied the words of Jefferson. To make the point, all men are created equal. But that's a goal. That's not right this second. That's a goal. We've always had racism. And we're, oh, we're going to have racism when, you, when all of us pass away and go to the next life and face our maker. That's a Some of us don't want to face our maker. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's going to be a day. That's the original uh, when all of us do that, you're still going to have racism. But you don't want to institutionalize it. That's the danger. We, we did do that. But anyway, you got Martin Luther King Day. I want to know what Jefferson said. I want the young people to know that. I want Washington's on a separate day. I don't want Nordstrom's day. And I want Lincoln. Because Lincoln is the one who preserved what Madison did. See, that's the dirty little secret. You, you can say whatever you want about Lincoln. I've heard a lot of things about him. I'm astonished. I'm absolutely astonished what we're doing. It, it is destructive. It is not the way we should be going. Well, they got to the slavery issue. It looked as if I've got to tell you this. This is very important. It looked as if the Con the Constitution Convention was <laughs> going to uh, was going to break up. It got to a crisis period. Would you read, read uh, any good book about the Constitution? There's a crisis period. And it looked like um, Washington, uh, uh, one of the founders wrote in their diary that Washington looked worse then than he did at Valley Forge. It was that, it was really, Washington wanted to put together a union he didn't say much, but it looked like we couldn't do it. Well, all of a sudden, Gunning Benf Bedford from uh, Delaware pointed a finger at Madison and said, Sir, I do not trust you. Now, this is, he's from one of the small states, Delaware. He said, sir, I do not trust you, and I will take the arm of a foreign government rather than do that. And when he said that, Rufus King from Massachusetts was boiled over, and they almost had a fist fight. <laughs> they almost went to fisticuffs. Because Rufus King says, I don't want any foreign government. And that moment, you had a great man. It happened to be there. And this great man really couldn't stand up. He had um, 
gallstones, huge gallstones. And he was taken in the meeting. He was carried in a, a French settee that he got from France. And he had the prisoners of the state penitentiary in Pennsylvania carry him in. They were doing something positive. They carried him in. Benjamin Franklin, on this particular occasion, got up. And he said, sir, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And then he, he spoke and said, we called on the Father of Illuminations in this chamber for the, for, the, for the late war of independence. We haven't done that here. We haven't said prayer. He says, I beg leave, Mr. President. It was Nathaniel Gorham that was sitting up there. It wasn't Washington then. He said, I beg leave that this chamber and we as delegates have prayer every morning before we attend to business. Hamilton got up and said, no, I don't think we should have prayer. It's too late for that. And if the people see that we're having prayer, they'll think there's problems. And you know what happened? They never did have prayer. And you know why they didn't? Not because of Hamilton. Because they couldn't afford the minister. That's right. Look it up. Don't believe me. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to study. I want you to look it up. They couldn't afford the minister. They didn't. But I want to tell you what happened. Because Franklin made that speech, and it was an impassioned speech. How old was Franklin in 1787? He was in his 80s. He was in his 80s. He's 81. 81 years old. They, t today, if you have gallstones, you can go to... You know, you go to a doctor, take him out. He couldn't do anything much for it then. Um, but because of the respect they had for Franklin and the passion speech that he gave, it changed the tenor of the meeting. And everybody kind of looked and said, maybe we should try and do it one more time. Let's give it another try. And they started to tend to business, and they got real serious about it. And then the compromises started to come. You had a great man get up named Roger Sherman from Connecticut. They couldn't decide on the upper house. Uh, Madison was against the upper house having two senators. He was against it. But Roger Sherman came up with the idea, look, uh, so that the small states will agree to this, otherwise we're going to walk. We need equal representation in the upper house. And they took a vote, and lo and behold, it had gone down before. They had voted on this before, gone down. But lo and behold, you had a couple of delegates that left. By the way, there's a book called American Pageant that the schools accepted. It's a very bad thing, I believe, because I spent seven to eight hours with it. Uh, and one of the statements in that book is that there were 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention every day. That's a lie. It's not true. There were 55 delegates, but they never attended all at once. You had like 30 at the most, 30, 35. They were all doing things. Well, on this day that they voted for representation, Lo and behold, some of the states, some of the delegates weren't there. And part of the rules was this. You had to have, a de if you had a delegate in the city, okay, you had to have a certain amount in the city to be able to vote on things. You had to have a majority of the delegates around. And then if you only had like three of the five come, it was a two to one vote and then you could get your way. Well, a couple of the delegates didn't come, and one of the states switched their vote, and lo and behold, you had a 5-4 vote to have two senators. And the big states were ready to walk. How do you like that? <laughs> they were so upset. They thought this was wrong. James Wilson thought it was wrong. Madison thought it was wrong. And uh, Washington got to talking to them and said, 
we're closer now than we've ever been. Let's not do anything. Let's just, let's go forth now. And they left it alone. It was a five, very close vote. And it was a wise vote because after that, the small states then started to vote for things. They started to vote for a stronger central government. They were ready to walk. And then they had to compromise the uh, slavery, which I talked about. And they had to compromise commerce, too. South Carolina, there was a deal to compromise commerce. And some of these deals were made at taverns outside the, the uh, convention, the way politics is normally done. There's nothing wrong with uh, 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 being political on things. But what, what's, your end point? what's your end game? What are you going to do with that power? What are you going to do with it? Well, uh, finally, and I didn't even, because we've only got five minutes left, believe it or not. <laughs> I wanted to tell you the story of the Bill of Rights, but the Bill of Rights was another miracle because by the time the Congress started, and when did the first Congress meet? 1791. When, by the time the Congress started, they didn't want the Bill of Rights because they had other problems. They had revenue problems, they had border problems, they had all kinds of problems. And it was Madison who shepherded the whole thing through. And they boiled it down. They started out with 189 amendments. 189. And uh, Madison boiled it down to 17 and went over to the Senate. They boiled it down to 12. And finally, they went out to the states and came back with 10. That's how you got the Bill of Rights. Well, at the end of the Constitutional Convention, Uh, it came time on my birthday. September 17th. September 17th. It's very nice of them to do this for me. Uh, that's when uh, also September 17th, 1796 is when what? What happened September 17th, 1796? My birthday again. <laughs> well, a guy named George Washington gave his farewell address, which we don't even read anymore. And in that farewell he address, he said, about the Constitution, he said, we need to perpetuate it, not throw it out. How do you like that? That was nice of him to do it on my birthday. I really appreciate that. Well, September 17, 1787, they got down to business, and they had how many delegates there? How many delegates were present the day they were going to sign? They had quite a few there that day. 42. And how many signed? No. You're, I told you, you're not right very often. <laughs> 39. Three did not sign. Edmund Randolph didn't sign. George Mason didn't sign from Virginia. And Elbridge Jerry, a really a crotchety guy, he didn't sign it, but, but he became the vice president for who? Elbridge Jerry didn't sign the Constitution, but he became vice president for who? Madison. How do you like that in the second term? Elbridge Jerry. So they didn't sign it. They didn't think it had a Bill of Rights. Well, okay. So then all of a sudden, Madison's taking the notes, and uh, he records the old man wept. Franklin. Franklin wept because Franklin had been through a long life and he didn't think that human beings could get together and cobble something like this out. And he made a speech. He says, it's, it's not perfect. He says, there's things I don't like about it. But it's a great document and we should all sign it and give our own fallibility away a little bit. We're all a little bit infallible. We all make mistakes. Sign it. It's the best that there's ever been. And uh, they went up to sign. And Madison's still taking notes. And all of a sudden, he hears Franklin telling a story. He said, now I know. He takes a look at Washington's chair. And on Washington's chair, there's a half a son. He says, the French like to do uh, artwork like this, but you're never sure if the sun is rising or setting in French art. He says, happily for the nation, 
I now know. It's a rising sun. Well, they, they left the uh, convention, and Madison is still writing. And all of a sudden, Dr. Franklin leaves the convention. Dr. Franklin, that's what they called him, Dr. Franklin. He leaves the convention, and a great document had been spawned by the hand of mankind, and nobody thought they could do it. And it didn't look like they were going to do it. He got out, and a woman, some people think it was Mercy Otis Warren, a great patriotic woman from uh, Massachusetts, whose uh, husband was killed at Bunker Hill, and he was gouged and bayoneted. Oh, it's just terrible what the British did. And she asked Franklin, Sir, what are you giving us? That famous quote, he says, A republic, if you can keep it, may God bless us to keep it. Thank you. Thank you.